everybody. It's Allie and welcome to the State of YNR chat. <laughs> it's Sunday, February 7th, 2021, and another one bites the dust. <laughs> Oh, no! No! Ooh, it's brutal out there. Late on Sunday, last Sunday, Danny Bowes, the actor who plays Chance, announced on Instagram that he was out as Chance Chancellor, out of the Chance Manch, and that his last episode would be airing on Monday, the following day. <sighs> now this was met with a lot of feelings by the fans. <laughs> we all had a lot of feelings about this. <laughs> So I thought, let's just start out with a flash pull on this question, a flash pull question. Um, what do you think? What do you think about Chance's sudden departure? Is it woohoo? All right, I wouldn't really miss him. Or is it boohoo? I'm disappointed. YRChat.com is where you can cast your vote on that poll. I'm disappointed, but I am not shocked. I'm enraged, <laughs> but not really. I'm enraged more for fun. <laughs> And I know a lot of people are enraged for real and also shocked and confused. So I thought, you know what, let's start out by just reviewing a couple of facts, the things that we know are true, and then we'll get into the heavy speculating and the heavy rage and enrage. <laughs> Frankly, all of the behind the scenes drama that goes on with The Young and the Restless is better than the show. <laughs> I've said before, I think CBS could develop an all new series. Maybe they could develop it for Paramount Plus. Coincidentally, debuting on March 4th, Paramount Plus is replacing CBS All Access. They could develop an all new show for Paramount Plus that just follows the real life drama behind the scenes of a soap opera. I think it's a great idea. I would watch it. <laughs> okay, back to the scandal at hand. <laughs> the scandal. Here's what happened to Danny. September of 2020, he signed a brand new three-year contract with Y&R. That's five months ago he was signing a three-year contract. And then on Christmas Eve 2020, he got his final scripts and was told that he would be done by March. It's February. He's done. He's gone. I think there's a couple of things right away that we can glean from this. First of all, although this was a surprise to the fans, we're shocked. YNR has known about this since before Christmas. They knew since before Christmas that they were letting him go, that they were getting rid of the character of Chance. So what exactly happened between September and December? Okay, so that's the fun part. <laughs> I feel like that's, 
the fun part where we just get to speculate and be angry and come up with all kinds of wild theories. And that's what I'm here to do today. What happened in two months that made Danny Bowes go from signing a three-year contract with the show to getting booted out the door two months later? Well, the other fact that we know, he got COVID. Danny Bowes got COVID Y&R then realized that they could just bring in Justin Gaston to replace him and get way more mileage out of Melissa Ordway. Since that wedding aired, I have been saying that if I were Danny Bowes, I would be worried about my job. Danny Bowes, as chance, was so inconsequential that YNR went ahead and filmed a wedding without the groom. What does that tell ya? Chance wasn't even at his own wedding. And here's the thing. The fans didn't care. Oh, I have no doubt that there are a lot of fans who are caring right now, but where were all of the fans that were outraged about, that are outraged about him now, where were they then? Because the only two people who seemed to even care that Danny wasn't there at the Abby and Chance wedding was like me and Sandra. <laughs> We're like the only two people that even cared or questioned it. Everybody else was like, yay, this was the greatest wedding YNR has ever done. And I was so shocked by the fact that they just went ahead with it that I made a poll question out of it for that week. 70% of you didn't give a crap that Chance wasn't there, that he got recast, and I got jumped on for criticizing YNR's decision to move forward. It was December 6th, 2020. I asked you guys, an Abby and Chance wedding without Chance? Was this a good move or a bad idea? 70% of you said it was a good idea. 30% said it was a bad idea. So me and Sandra were over here in the 30% waving our hands in the corner quietly saying, oh, I like Danny Boaz's chance. He matters. Oh, but now everybody's outraged. So don't worry, you won't be outraged in three months when Justin Gaston shows up as Abby's sperm donor. Don't forget, Y&R told Danny Bowes that he was done on Christmas Eve 2020. So that surrogacy storyline that's going on right now may feel like something that Y&R started and stopped, but that's not what it is. That is the story. This was always the story. YNR couldn't turn around and just replace Chance just because Danny got COVID and they realized that they liked somebody else better. That would have been opening themselves up to a huge lawsuit. You can't just fire somebody because of their medical condition, but you can pay off the actor's contract, send the character off onto a secret agent mission to Mars, and then bring on somebody else. Bring on Laura Lee Bell to soften the blow about Chance. Chance died a hero. Oh, hang on to that, Abby. Hang on to that, fans. Chance died a hero. <laughs> oh, no, no, 
don't anybody be mad at Chance. Laura Lee Bell is here to tell you that. And then, three months down the road, we're going to bring on a mysterious new character after the fan rage has calmed down and this new character can make the baby with Abby, fall in love with Abby, kiss her, be intimate with her all over the place, share all of the new baby moments, and all of this without the need for COVID testing. Hell, maybe we can even bring on Melissa Ordway's kids to be on the show someday. The fans won't even care by then. Nobody's going to be talking about Chance by then. Oh, but what happens when both Melissa and Justin get COVID? What will we do then? What will happen to YNR's filming schedule then? <laughs> eh, just keep going. Just keep going. Wing it. Throw something out there. <laughs> oh, that felt good. <laughs> that felt good to get off my chest. But don't get me wrong, I know how it sounds. My rant, my beef is absolutely not about Melissa Ordway or Justin Gaston. It's not even about Danny Bowes. Danny Bowes got paid for a three-year contract without even having to show up to work. He'll be fine. We'll be fine. Actors come and go. You know, I mean, a lot of actors, a lot of characters come and go on this show, and it'll be fine. What really ticks me off is that it seems like a real corporate creep kind of move to do. It's a real corporate creep kind of move that really, in my opinion, perfectly highlights why the show isn't doing all that well with the fans right now. I don't want to say it. I don't want to talk like this. You know me. I'm the most pro YNR fan there is, but the show ratings are down. They are losing fans. I guess some of the people who are coming to YNR chat every week to let me know that they're going to stop watching the show may have actually stopped watching the show. I just feel like this YNR executive team, the current team, is always focused on the wrong freaking things. The fans aren't tuning in so that we can watch people do smoochy face scenes every day of the week. We're not wanting that as much as we're just wanting a story that is consistent, that makes sense, that is compelling, using characters who make sense, they're consistent, they're compelling. That's what we want. I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is a decision that was influenced by the network. But Josh Griffiths is the executive producer and the head writer of The Young and the Restless. And the buck stops with him. If the ratings are down, it falls on him. CBS executives would not come out of the woodwork on a show that's working well to force him to can a front burner character out of nowhere. He would have had to have agreed to it or he would have had to be the one to come up with it. And I'm sorry to tangent so hard into a Josh Griffith rant, but the way that Danny Bowes was handled, the way that Chance's exit was handled strikes a larger nerve with me. Josh Griffith has not earned my respect as the head of this show. The guy was fired from YNR and he quit from YNR more than once. I don't know any other job where you can keep quitting and getting fired and still have the job. Is he the only game in town or what? I don't get it. Isn't there anybody else out there? who could take this show in a fresh, new, logical direction while still respecting its 45-year legacy and all of the fans who've been watching it for that long. 
there has got to be someone out there. <laughs> someone help. <laughs> SOS. And it's not about whether or not I like one or more of the particular stories. This guy cannot develop a story. He has no idea where he is going. There is no focus in the writing. I mean, whoever is doing a lot of the character dialogue right now is doing a good job. We're getting some good moments. But the overall structure of the show is a mess. It is all over the map. It's never consistent week to week and month to month. Chance, whether he is there or not, is not the problem. They could have cut Chance a year ago. They could have never brought him back at all. The executives of YNR are the problem here and it doesn't really matter how many actors contracts they decide to cut to save money it doesn't really matter how many crossovers with bold and the beautiful that they do that's not going to get the ratings up for more than a couple of weeks at a time josh griffin sucks <laughs> he sucks at the job of writing thoughtful, meaningful shows that people want to watch. He's been in the job for two years. He's had two years to do this. And he, he thinks people think, people are currently thinking that people aren't watching The Young and the Restless because of COVID? Or because there's so many other options out there in the world. Soaps just can't hack it. No. They had captive viewers because of COVID. This could have been a brand new golden era of soap operas now that people are staying home again. But they blew it. They blew it. They blew it big. And now they're scrambling to try to fix it. And now the big idea is for them to cut underused contracts of people who are under long-term contracts but are not really being used as characters on the show. I'm hearing Greg Rickart. I'm hearing Christian LeBlanc. I'm even hearing Tracy Bergman, although none of that is confirmed. But YNR's big idea right now is to cut the underused contracts and to try to use Bold and the Beautiful contracts to try to do more crossovers to try to harness the power of both soaps in order to save both soaps. While CBS isn't going to keep funding a show that's losing money and losing viewers. So YNR has realized that if they can't pull in viewers that are new, considering the fact they have these inconsistent stories, they've got these inconsistent stories that aren't pulling in new viewers. So the only thing left that they can do is to try to pull soap viewers between the two soaps that they already have to try to get fans to watch both shows. Well, I hope that works. I really do. I really hope that strategy works because I'm going down with the ship. I love The Young and the Restless. I will watch The Young and the Restless till either I die or it dies. <laughs> But this is ridiculous. Bring me the broomstick of Josh Griffith and I will show you the way back to Kansas. <laughs> nah. <laughs> what do I know about writing a soap opera? I mean, seriously, what do I know about any of this? Disregard everything I just said. I'm just a soap opera fan. That's all it is. I'm just a fan of the show, but sometimes I do think that maybe our chat about the show is far more entertaining than The Young and the Restless itself right now. It didn't always used to be that way, though. Oh, I understand that it's entertainment. And so therefore, are you entertained right now? Have you been entertained? I hope so. <laughs> Because I am definitely not going to get my set tour now. <laughs>
Josh Griffith would never let me on to the stage. The sound stage, forget it, I'm banned. There's a big picture of me right now with a circle in her neck through it. They're never letting me onto that show, but I don't know, I'm speaking my truth. <laughs> oh. y and had three months, three months to work out a proper exit for Chance. Like everything from the wedding on was written after they had already decided to let Danny go and Danny knew about it. They left space for Chance's infertility weeks ago when Abby was insisting that they both get checked out. And what is it what is Chance's mystery condition, by the way? I don't I don't know. <laughs> like I started realizing early in the week that, oh, they knew they were going to do this. They did plant little seeds. They left little breadcrumbs along the way. And it just was abrupt right at the end, in, like in one day. What is Chance's mystery condition? Like, what happened to him? Something happened to him in the hospital when he got shot. Has something to do with some medication. So he's infertile right now, but it comes and goes. <laughs> He told Abby that it comes and goes. He could be infertile today, but perfectly fertile tomorrow. Come on. <laughs> YNR did not have a good enough plan for his exit. That's the truth. They thought maybe he'll be infertile and run away. Maybe he'll get called on a mission. Maybe we'll just figure it out when we get there. Who knows? Maybe it's all of the above. But if Danny had to go, if that was the decision, then why not bother to actually write him out rather than having him just disappear? Or at the very least, they could have, while they were planting little plot seeds, they could have done some mysterious, threatening phone calls that Chance has been receiving. Even if they had done that for a week, it would have been better. Or they needed to do something uh, to show Chance having some emotional wavering. We're just supposed to believe that Chance ditched his whole life his family, his mother, his wife, his new wife. For a job saving the world? I mean, Chance consciously decided to stop saving the world when he left the FBI. He wanted to stay in Genoa City so that he could be with Abby. He was leaving all of that save the world stuff behind. And now he just leaves abruptly and tells her to just go on and have the baby without him. Just go on and have the baby without me, baby. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <sighs> so now, I guess, Abby and Mariah are having a baby. <laughs> Abby and Mariah are having a baby. And here's what's going to happen. Abby and Mariah are going to find an anonymous donor who sounds so good on paper. Wow, this guy. They're going to go through with it. Mariah's going to get pregnant. A few months from now, when the viewers calm down from their outrage over chance, the new donor's going to pop up. And he's going to be played by Justin Gaston. It's not that hard to see. <laughs> Abby's going to get word that Chance has gone MIA. Maybe he's presumed dead. She's assumed to be widowed. And she will be free to move on and raise her family with Justin, the father, the biological father of her child. Boom! Bada boom! What a great story! What a great idea! Josh must be patting himself on the back right now. Oh, probably all the other writers in the writer's room are lining up to pat him on the back right now, too. Wow, Josh, good story. Good idea. 
Whatever you say, Josh. Where are all the other writers? <laughs> like, I mean, there are like six women who are credited after him on, on the writing team, written by Josh Griffith, and then there's like six other women's names. Like, these are not one person who has the gall to say to him, hey, Josh, that ain't good. That's a little obvious. Why don't we try this instead? Start, one of these other writers needs to start lining themselves up for that head writer position. Start pushing forward some good ideas and going around him so they can get his job when he gets fired or quits. They're all scared for their jobs too is what it is. Nobody cares about Danny Bo's job. They care about their job. So whatever you say, Josh, head writer, executive producer, maybe another Victor Newman retirement party will get the ratings up for a week. Or a wedding. Or a marriage that will be destroyed another month later. That sounds good, Josh. Sounds good to me. Keep up the good work. I am hearing Jordi Villasuso's name on the list of cuts too, but that's not new. Although, I don't know. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. I'm guessing that Sharon and Ray's new marriage is on the chalk beam block next based on that preview last week. Ray was giving Sharon all of the room to make whatever decision it was she wanted when it came to Adam, and now next week in the previews, he's given her an ultimatum. Hmm. Okay. Boy. Well. I mean, we definitely better do whatever we gotta do to get Adam and Sharon together. Writers, guys, come on, because we gotta get Sharon Case and Mark Grossman into some fizzy, kissy face scenes right now. Because COVID is our biggest problem right now, right? Right, guys? Right? It's definitely just the COVID. So let's, we got to do what we got to do to get those scenes going. That'll save the show. That'll get the ratings up. <laughs> the Bold and the Beautiful is bringing back Kelly Krueger onto their show. Hey, I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that she's married to Darren Brooks, who plays Wyatt. It's discriminatory is what it is. Am I right, Ellen? <laughs> Resident attorney, Ellen? I mean, for crying out loud, you gotta be married to someone now or publicly dating someone now to get a job on either of these shows. Wait, wait a minute. Devon and Elena's quickie hookup couldn't have anything to do with COVID, could it? Ooh, I'm having fun today. <laughs> I'm having too much fun today. I'm back, baby. <laughs> fire and Danny Bose was just the thing I needed to light my fire. The Elena and Devon thing doesn't make any sense to me. Elena and Devon have now got this sexy groove going on that's great, looking like they're wanna, wanting to devour each other. But what I don't get is why Elena is putting it off. Elena tells Devon that, yeah, I'm so glad we slept together, but she owes it to Nate to see if their relationship is going anywhere. Why would she say that? Why would she do that? She was dreaming of Devon while she was in bed with Nate just last week. Why would Elena pass up the chance to dump Nate and get back together with Devon when that's all she's ever wanted since the moment after she slept with Nate? Here's your chance, Elena. <laughs> Here's your chance. You've had them both. You still wanted Devon. And now you've got Devon in your grasp. Literally, you had him in your grasp. So why not just take him back? I don't get it. <sighs> and I pride myself on trying real hard to get it. <laughs> Sometimes I have to try real hard to get it. <laughs> I guess Elena's approach to life is have sex and think about it later. I like that about her. 
But apparently what she and Devon had was just resolution sex. You know, the kind of sex that you have when you just do it one more time just to make sure everything is resolved. <laughs> We better keep this to be, this better just be our little secret though. We better not tell Nate what happened though. Cause you never know, Nate might haul off, punch someone, give him a permanent injury. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Elena already tried telling the truth when she had oopsie sex with Nate. And that didn't work out too well for her. I mean, we wouldn't want both guys knowing that she cheated on them, right? Why in our physically incapacitated Chelsea just to have an excuse to film these fantasy Adam and Sharon kissing scenes? It's so obvious that this little loophole that YNR has found is what is driving the show these days. If you're dating your co-star, then you can get screen time. But it's putting the cart before the horse. I don't want to see Chelsea in this chair just so I can see Sharon and Adam kissing in a dream sequence twice a week. It's not fair to the actors who aren't dating a soap star. If I were Melissa Claire Egan, I would be worried about my job now, too. The one bright, shiny little spot in this story around Chelsea and Adam and Sharon is the irony of the counseling sessions with Sharon. <laughs> I do enjoy that. Although Sharon talking to Chelsea and Chelsea responding in voiceover is getting a little cheesy for my taste but I do like and did enjoy Sharon trying to get Chelsea all riled up. I thought that was fun. Just like saying the things that she knew would get a reaction out of Chelsea, just to try to get some kind of emotional reaction in order to push her beyond her physical restrictions. I don't even think Sharon needed to say anything though. All she really needed to do would show up in one of her leather numbers, that would have been enough. <laughs> I did notice though that Sharon did tone down her wardrobe for her very first counseling session with Chelsea. She went with a tight black leather skirt instead of the tight tan leather pants. And then she went with a white deep v-neck blouse instead of the white off the shoulder peasant girl blouse from last week. So, okay. <laughs> Chelsea's about to make a full recovery, I hope. We've had two weeks of secret finger wiggling after two weeks of fantasies about Adam and Sharon kissing right in front of her, I think Chelsea better start working on wiggling some toes next. I need to see her wiggling them toes now so she can hopefully stand up out of the wheelchair and toss Sharon off the penthouse window. <laughs> Especially if Sharon's about to be single again soon. Ray. Poor Ray. Greatest guy ever. Totally getting screwed over here. Ray finds a vodka bottle cap in between the couch cushions the day after Jordan spent the night with Faith. So Sharon calls a counselor over immediately. Can you imagine your mom catching you drinking and then dragging a counselor into the house over it? I don't know. I mean, be honest. How many of you had tried alcohol maybe a couple times by the age of 15 
And then imagine your parents finding out about it and their approach <laughs> is to bring a counselor in. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. And finding that answer has caused some friction between Nick and Sharon. Sharon's all in on this immediate counseling, but Nick really wanted to give Faith the benefit of the doubt here. He really wanted to give her a chance to explain. Nick is very afraid of pushing Faith further away. As he so eloquently put it, there's more than one way to lose a child. Ooh. So, I guess one more uh, one more effort at the soft road is, is the approach. And Nick and Sharon sit down with Faith and they try to talk to her about the bottle cap, but it's like a wall. Faith just denies, denies, denies until Nick and Sharon feel like they're not getting anywhere. And that's when Grandma Nikki steps in. I'm going to be alone in this opinion. I can just feel it. But I appreciate Nikki's input on the side. I don't like Nikki stepping in as if she were the parent. Nikki came into that situation and she did this move where she suggested that Nick and Sharon should step away so that she could talk to Faith. And Faith seemed to love that idea. Because, of course, mom and dad don't understand me. And I didn't like that. Kids shouldn't get to just go whining to the grandparents to try to get a better deal. To try to get the real deal that they're looking for. Nick and Sharon should have insisted on staying there and being a part of whatever conversation was happening with Faith. Nikki didn't even stick with Faith all that long. She kind of pawned Faith off on Victor for an off-screen chess life lesson. I find that so trite. The, the, oh, Victor's teaching her a life lesson over chess. I find that just as trite as cookies or brownies or hibiscus tea. Faith needed more than a chess match, which, by the way, she told Jordan that she was letting Victor win, and I find that funny. <laughs> but I feel like Nick and Sharon were a big old bucket of failure here. <sighs> On the bright side, pawning Faith off onto Victor to play chess. That's a pun. Get it? <laughs> pawning Faith off onto Victor to play chess. Okay. Okay, you got it. I feel like, though, on the bright side, it gave Sharon the opportunity to confront Jordan specifically. And that was a great, great moment. I was jumping out of my seat saying, Go, Sharon! I loved those scenes. I also loved Jordan's taste in outerwear. Her black leather and cream shearling coat was just fantastic. She looked great, but the girl needs someone to stand up to her. And Sharon was so sly about it, telling Jordan to back off of Faith. And it was just polite enough, but just distinct enough too, to be unmistakable. Jordan got the message. But unfortunately, Faith walked in, saw the whole thing, which I fear will alienate her even further. <sighs> I don't know, maybe it's time to just let Faith go live with Grandma and Grandpa again. I'm sure that Victor can straighten her out, maybe teach her a few more life lessons while she's cleaning out the stables. Victor stops by Newman Enterprises this week, and it was great how Victoria just understood that the desk was his to sit at. <laughs> if he wants that desk, that's where he's going to sit. <laughs> and I thought it was nice seeing Victor behind the desk, at least for a few scenes. 
too bad someone couldn't have hung the portrait back up just just for just for that occasion anytime victor comes to sit down in his office we need an intern to run that portrait up the wall <laughs> oh well, Victor wants to have a family dinner with Nikki and, and the children, so he commands Nick and Victoria to f fix whatever it is that their current squabble is and come to dinner. So Nick tells Victoria that in order to do that, in order to squash the beef, she's going to have to apologize to his girlfriend, Phyllis, and that's what Victoria does. That's kind of surprising to me that she went through of it. And I also thought that Victoria did a pretty good job of faking it. <laughs> she, she, she faked that apology pretty darn well. Victoria admitted to Phyllis that her hostile takeover of the Grand Phoenix was personal and it was not business. And I felt like Victoria made a very solid effort there. But of course, Phyllis wasn't convinced. <laughs> Phyllis realized that it was Nick's request and that's why Victoria did it. Are we gonna see this family dinner? Are we gonna go to the ranch and get this Newman family dinner? And if so, will Phyllis be there? Because I've noticed that Phyllis is always dodging Nick's invitations to family things or to events. Phyllis didn't go to Abby and Chance's wedding as Nick's date. She didn't go to Ray and Sharon's wedding as his date. Wait a minute, maybe that's the problem with both of those marriages. Phyllis wasn't at either of those weddings and so the marriages are doomed. Victoria has been to paradise, but she's never been to me. <laughs> <laughs> Please let somebody get that. Please let somebody get that joke. <laughs> oh, how corny. <laughs> the state of Victoria. I'm dying. I'm dead. <laughs> the state of Victoria. How timely. That's some relevant the time timeliness right there, the state of Victoria. You know, it is about time that Victoria got in touch with herself, with her feelings, find out what she really wants out of life and, and you know, and maybe it's not just the title, maybe it's not the thing she thought she wanted. I'm glad we're here. I'm glad we had that moment with Victoria. I'm glad we had this special episode. After all of that bonding from last week, suddenly Victoria was freezing Billy out. She was telling him not to come by the house so much because she needs her boundaries and she doesn't want to give the kids the wrong impression about them. So it was clear early in the week that Victoria was trying to save herself emotionally. I think in all of those sweet moments between her and Billy and the family, she found herself feeling vulnerable around him. And so she had to put a stop to it. That's very Victoria. It's also very Victoria to feel the need to control things. And I do think there's an element here that's about control for her. Victoria has something that Billy wants. They're kids. Lily may have Billy's heart, but Victoria has his kids. I totally get where Victoria's coming from though, now that we've had this special episode. I get, a, I get her surprise over Billy's new evolution because it's true that Victoria is the one who put in all of the work on Billy for years and then Lily gets to swoop in and take this cool new guy. Victoria feels like Lily is living her life, the work the the, the life that she worked really hard to try to establish with him. 
Victoria is the one that pulled him up out of the gutter and worked with him for all those years. And now Lily's swooping in and taking the spoils while Billy moves further and further back into that black distance. Yeah, but based on Victoria's conversation with Nikki and also all of those discerning looks from Nikki, I do think that Victoria realizes that although she loves Billy and although she wishes she could go back, she knows logically that that's not the path. The path is forward. It needs to be onward and upward. I mean, Victoria, as much as she likes to control things, she cannot control Billy and Lily falling in love. How many times did her own father try to do that to her, to control who she loved? Um, the only piece of leverage that Victoria has is those kids. And I do appreciate that she's not blatantly using them, at least not yet. <laughs> She did tell Billy that she wishes that he wouldn't bring Lily around the kids because they're older now. They're going to be able to sense what's going on and who knows how long his relationship with Lily will last. I mean, that's true. I think it's kind of a fair statement. She, she, she didn't sugarcoat it at all. She could have, but she didn't. But it's true. It's still true. Lily may get to enjoy all of the perks of this cool new guy, but for how long? How long until Billy gets restless again? I thought it was a very interesting moment that Lily breezed past when Billy was texting with Victoria to try to clear the air between them, and his first instinct was to lie to Lily about it. And <laughs> Billy lies smooth as silk. That's what bugs me about Billy. His lies are smooth as silk. He didn't even miss a beat. He just lied to Lily, saying he was texting about business and that's not what was going on, but he caught himself he fessed up to Lily, and Lily barely reacted to it. Like, she barely batted an eye. Why? Why would she not take that as a red flag? I would be thinking, oh, well, how nice of him to change his mind and decide not to lie to me. But if he could lie so easily about something so small, then what happens when there is a lie that he decides is worth keeping? Like, Lily doesn't seem to be concerned about all of the red flags. She dismisses them. Any concerns anybody has about Billy, she dismisses them because, well, he's not lying to me now. And that's great, and I appreciate Lily's stance on second chances, but she just doesn't seem to even register the red flags. She was talking to Amanda this week about Billy and Victoria and that whole situation that Amanda was a witness to, but I got the impression that Lily was more on a fact-finding mission just to try to figure out where Victoria's head is now. Like, so that she could be prepared for whatever Ms. Newman decides to throw her way. <sighs> Billy and Lily are all in on each other. Billy decides to rebuff Victoria's preference to not bring Lily around the kids by declaring to himself and to Lily that Lily is the one for him. This isn't just a fling. She's the one. To which Lily responds that she feels that's true too. <laughs> she really didn't say I love you. She just like confirmed his feeling that she's the one. Well, of course they're going to think that. They've known each other forever, but they've only been dating for a few months. They haven't even hit the I love you stage yet. I'm not saying that Victoria is 100% right. But I do wonder how much Billy and how much Lily are pushing their relationship forward out of rebellion, 
toward the rest of the world for doubting them. So Gloria has some debts. <laughs> oh, I bet she has some debts. I have no doubt that Gloria has some debts. You don't dress like Gloria dresses without having a few debts, I'd imagine. <laughs> well, Gloria loves a very luxurious lifestyle. Who could blame her? She has an appreciation for the finer things in life. I mean, Gloria has had and lost a lot of money in her time. And after Phyllis turns down her newest request for a job at the Grand Phoenix, Gloria makes one final plea to Lauren. And since Lauren has given Sally a promotion, well, maybe she can transition that position over to Gloria. Now, was that so hard? Why was that so hard? Just give the woman a job. I don't even know why Gloria felt the need to follow up with Michael. It was great to see Michael. I mean, if it were up to me, the Baldwin Fishers would be one of the front and center families on this show. They're gold. But I was confused. I thought that Lauren agreed to give Gloria the position. Why would she mention it otherwise? Yet Gloria felt the need to go begging Michael for his blessing and begging Lauren for the opportunity. Like there, there's, there's nothing more noble than someone who just wants to work. Admittedly, I'm not sure that I would want Gloria to be my personal <laughs> assistant. That might end up being too much Gloria on a daily basis. But it's going to be very entertaining for my screen, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Just give her the job. Apparently, Lauren's executive assistant job is the job for anyone who's looking to get a fresh start in Genoa City. That's the Genoa City starter job. That's the I'm not that person anymore job. Finally, we get some drama courtesy of Theo Vanderway Abbott Mergeron. <laughs> Thank you. Theo was looking extra awesome too in his black leather fingerless gloves with rings on each and every finger. And I'm asking myself, did Theo put on his rings before or after the black leather fingerless gloves? Like, do you put on the rings and then try to shove your hand up through the black fingerless glove? Or do you put on the black fingerless glove and then put rings on each finger? I don't know these, que these answers. These are the important questions that I have that have gone unanswered. <laughs> The other important question is, does Kyle know that he has a kid, a secret love child named Harrison? <laughs> yeah, I like it. I think it could be fun to see Harrison. I kind of would like to see this three-year-old Hellraiser son of Kyle's throwing wrenches into Kyle and Summer's tight little life. It also would make Jack an instant grandpa, which is pretty great. Grandpa Jack and Grandma Sally. <laughs> little Harrison at the Abbott Mansion with Grandpa Jack, Grandma Sally. After Jack and Sally tie the knot, and Sally helps Jack remember to take his arthritis pills and then tucks him into bed at six. That works for me. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Another question I have is, if Kyle has a son, then surely there is a mother who will follow. So do we know who Michael Milor is dating in real life? And can we give her a crash course in acting 
so that we can get a proper love triangle going now on the show. Oh, I am a brat. <laughs> I am a real brat. But I will gladly bust a move. <laughs> that was our who said it quote from last week. And the uh, answer was Mariah. Mariah was uh, talking to Abby about their little impromptu dance party. And she was saying, hey, I will gladly bust a move. But the question on the table is, will she gladly bust a uterus? I think the answer seems to be yes. <laughs> Good job, Jamie, Henry, Diane K, Cherie, Tony, Tommy, Victoria, Janice, Ambreen, and Daisy, because you all guessed it right. Now, here is a fun new quote for this week. I don't know. This one spoke to me. We'll see if you can guess who said it. Nobody knows a woman's desire more than I. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's bold. Nobody knows a woman's desire more than I. Well, if you're feeling bold and you think you know who said that, you should go to yrchat.com to leave your guess. And if you get it right, then I will give you your shout out on next week's YNR chat. And in my continuing theme of I'm being a brat today, my runner up. Uh, quote for the week was, I guess everybody's cutting back these days. Oh, oh, everybody is cutting back these days. Sometimes it's actors' contracts, or sometimes it's Michael just taking Gloria out for a cheap coffee house date instead of a, a luxurious, uh, high class lunch that I suppose she wanted to have. Everybody's cutting back these days, Gloria said. I mean, that was a pretty timely, relevant moment right there. Gloria walks into the coffee house, is kind of like, well, I guess everybody's cutting back these days, and yeah, yeah, on the week of chance, I would say so. Leslie says, where is Leanna Love? We need her to write a book called Ruthless about the casting decisions recently. No kidding, right? They are pretty ruthless, and I don't know if the bloodbath is over. There could be more to come. Donna says, bring back Chance. It was my favorite story on YNR. Oh, I'm sorry, Donna. See, that's the sad thing. That's the worst part, because for some fans, this was the best part of the show. This was the story they were most excited about. And then to have it end so abruptly with absolutely no warning. I mean, that's just such a bummer. So, I mean, I, I have to say the Abby and Chance story wasn't my favorite, but I do kind of expect some consistency on the show and that's what really ticks me off. But um, yeah, I'm, so I'm sorry for anybody who was just like, hey, this was my story. This was the one I was most interested in because it's gone now. Sandra over here in the 30% with me said, I'm so perturbed about Chance leaving the show. I know it's just a television show and I shouldn't take it to heart, but I have. Don't all shows rely on viewer loyalty? The expectation that fans of the show fall in love with particular characters or find certain cast members relatable is why people tune in. No. They took Dina out of her bed to die in the living room chair. They sent Theo packing out of the blue and now Chance has vanished. I'm beyond annoyed. I know it, Sandra. I know it. I'm beyond annoyed, too. Sandra also says, set your DVR to record General Hospital for a couple of weeks. Outside of the love scenes, it's pretty normal. Restaurants are full of workers and guests. You see the hospital and its rooms and offices, different homes, the park, the police station. Having said this, why is GH able to maintain a high caliber show and YNR is not? Budget concerns are surely a concern on any show. Let's put it this way. How can Crimson Lights and society stay open when there's never any patrons in them? 
Well, that certainly is a good question. Why is it that GH has totally different standards for the COVID approach? I mean, I guess the answer is just that it's it's simply a different network. I do imagine that uh, CBS and whoever owns uh, CBS, presumably Sony, uh, I, they just must have their set of standards for what the COVID protocol is, and they just must be more conservative about it. Um, Danny did originally say in his Instagram post, but then deleted. He said that uh, he was also being cut because there was extra budget need for COVID testing. So um, I don't know, maybe that cut into some budgets too, but I just don't buy that it's a budget thing. I don't buy that it's just simply budgets. There's money. There's money to be put wherever they want to put it. If the show was doing well, they'd be getting more and more and more money. But it seems like the show is not doing all that well in the ratings. And so they're trying to find places that they can cut. That's kind of how it works. When the company's when, the, when a company's doing well, there's lots of money. When they're not doing well, there's less money. Uh, and, and we the fans just stuck, stuck here in the wind. We, oh, just whistling in the wind. Ellen says, I wish I felt like there was a sweeping grand plan that will all make perfect sense in the end, but somehow it seems more likely that we'll be left feeling confused and dissatisfied. Oh well, I know I'll always keep watching. I just have to keep tabs on Genoa Junction. I wonder, will they ever let poor, ditzy Abby Newman be happy? So many questions. It is the sad thing too is that this did feel like Abby's happy ending after you know for a character who's sort of based on this this unlucky in love situation after situation after situation to have her finally find her happiness and just be on the cusp of that and to have it ripped away is even more heartbreaking. Ellen goes on to say, "What goes on in the writer's room?" Is it chaos? Are there long story arcs that just get abandoned over a weekend and that's why we have whiplash so often? Are there producers and corporate people who step in and interfere with what the creative team wants to do and that's why the show seems so choppy? They should be very thankful for their actors because no matter what, they do a very good job of selling whatever story they're given to portray. The YNR cast is really excellent, even if I love to resent some of the YNR characters. I, I think all of the above, yes. I'm sure that there are many situations where the executives step in and get in the way of what the creative people want to do. It's just that at the end of the day, if the show were working and doing well, there's probably less interference. They would say, you keep doing what you're doing, good job. That just doesn't seem to be what's happening it does seem choppy and that's a good word choppy it seems like we start something and then we end something but then you know gauging what what's just happened with chance that that was planned that was the plan and it still seemed choppy <laughs> so what's it like when they don't have a plan Gary says, budget cuts are confusing. They drop someone currently important, like Chance Chancellor, and then they bring in a Trisha Cast, a longtime player whose services must cost a certain amount to babysit Abby in his absence. Something more would have to be going on. <sighs> There's no way that they were forced just to cut chance. Danny Bowes there. This guy was front and center on the show. Clearly YNR had plans at some point to build around him for 2021. He signed a three-year contract. They were gonna use him. And then something happened. Hmm, wonder what that could be. They got rid of him and they decided it was more cost effective to just cut the contract and be cut him loose, be done with them. I mean, if he gets paid out on his contract and no longer has to report, he's probably not gonna sue him. Probably not gonna sue him. And then as far as Trash Trisha Cast goes, um, I, I, she's probably on a per diem or something. They probably pay her a stipend to come in for the day, and it was cheaper to cut the chance contract, bring Trisha Cast and Tra Trisha Cast and Laura Lee Bell in for an episode to cover it up, to sweep it all under the rug, and they'll both be gone. I don't think this means long term for Trisha Cast. Unfortunately, I'd love to have her, but then again, that costs. 
Zuperflex says this has all the makings of top brass sending edicts down to the writing staff. They must have gotten really skittish over the lack of intimacy on the show. Yes, I think there, there's probably very true that there are network executives who have very strong preferences and want to, want to see what they want to see, but Josh Griffith should be the go-between in all of that. He's not just a writer. He is an executive producer. He's the head of the whole freaking show. Like, that guy's the head. He should be fighting for Y&R. Daisy says, I don't understand, though. Why didn't they move Danny Bose to another show? rather than throw him away like a bag of dirt. He just returned after surviving a horrible illness. You'd think they'd at least move him to another show as another character. If not, maybe another network will add him to a soap. And bonus, some of his fans might start to watch him there. Yeah, I think that's a possibility because I did read that Danny has something like seven jobs set up now. So good for him. They, they probably said, you're going to have time. You're going to have three months to line yourself up some job offers. You can still, that they didn't tell anybody he was leaving. So you can still tell people you're currently on Young and the Restless. Check out my work. And that probably would help him to get some jobs. And then in addition to that, they just paid out his contract. So I'm pretty sure that they probably gave him a, a sweet deal to just go quietly away. <laughs> I think they just didn't want to use him anymore because they knew what their plan was and their plan was Justin Gaston. That's my speculation anyway. Diana said, I was surprised that when Abby read the goodbye note from Chance that it wasn't in his voice. This means that he was not around to do the voiceover. Would have been nice to have heard the actor's voice for the final scene. I didn't even think of that, Diana. Yeah, that would have maybe made the goodbye note. The fact that he left his new wife, who was trying to have his baby, left her with a goodbye note, might have maybe been a little more personal for the fans if at least that note had been voiced with Danny. But no, it is the quickest, most bloody cut that I have seen in a while. Oh, Sherrod says, it was very interesting that YNR used Laura Lee Bell to inform the audience that Danny would not be, or sorry, that Chance would not be back for a long time. Allie, you did ask for Nina to be around longer. Seems like you got your request. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I should be careful what I uh, am wishing for. But, and then what was the Laura Lee Bell part of it? It was like, what, five minutes of screen time? And just the way she was going, oh no, your husband's a good man. No, no, he's a good man. Is that supposed to soften the blow? Yeah, I think that's the plan. Just bring Laura Lee Bell in, the fans will go, ooh, ah, Laura Lee Bell. And then they'll just not ask any questions and then whatever, we'll miss them. In three months, they won't be talking about Chance. We'll have on Justin Gaston. That's what everybody wanted anyway. That's what everybody was saying around the time of Abby and Chance's wedding. It was, ooh, I like this guy. We should have him on the show. Everybody was saying that. Everybody loved Justin Gaston. Well, you're gonna get Justin Gaston. You're gonna get him. <laughs> but you're not gonna have chance anymore and it seems like most people don't care I think I wonder if there is a lot of people who don't mind that chance is leaving but don't like the way it was handled maybe that's it Robbie says on the bright side it's been amazing to see Nina back on my screen I hope she sticks around for a while also, I can't wait to see who they cast as Chance. I'm so excited. <laughs> Can we get Ronan back while we wait for a new Chance? Yeah, no, um, Danny did say specifically there is no recast. He is um, gone, just gone. No, they're not gonna recast him, period. I think if, here's the thing, that's what I'm saying. If YNR would have just straight up recast the role of Chance, lawsuit, 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 no way. You cannot let the original actor be out with COVID, out sick, have a legitimate, obvious medical condition, and then recast him just because he got sick. That's what it would look like. It would, be, it would look like they were recasting him because he got sick. I think they realized they wanted to go in another direction because he got sick. But that's just my fun speculation. 
I also really like the idea that we could get Ronan back. <laughs> <laughs> we sure do ask for a lot and then we get mad when uh we have to lose something to to get to get it but i don't think we're going to be seeing nina on a long-term basis no way they just brought her in for uh, uh to, to soften the blow same as with christine oh boy well i asked you guys last week if you thought that it was a good idea for mariah to be abby and chance's gestational surrogate it was a pretty close vote 56 percent of you said yes let's make mariah the surrogate it's a good idea 44 percent said no i don't like it marianne v says i voted yes mariah should do it it'll make for a lot of drama and she's perfect because she's close to them and won't be a stranger. But we all know it won't go smoothly. Southside Granny says, no, they are too close. But then if Mariah would do it and then decide to keep the baby, what a storyline that would be. Tiffany says, I think Mariah being a surrogate is a good idea. I love Mariah personally, and I think we all know she's one of the more level-headed characters on the show. I don't think she'd go the route of trying to run away with the baby, given the fact that she knows what it's like to grow up and never know who you are or where you came from. But I do think she would be answering, uh, I do think she would uh, be a super awesome Auntie Mariah. Uh, that being said, I think an added level of fun would be if she got pregnant with twins. She's a twin, so that's a good possibility. I like that. I like that twist on it, that it would be uh, twins. But Sandra says, three women and a baby? No need for a husband or father. Future Chance can come home to the Chancellor compound to find Nina, Abby with a, Nina and Abby with a baby in tow, Mariah and, pregnant, uh, Mariah and pregnant Tessa all living there. Give me a break. <laughs> yes, this is very... Um, I don't know. It's like, yeah, we'll just have these babies without the guys. <laughs> Let's just get a compound of women together and we'll just we'll just do it without these dudes. Oh man. Well Sherrod says, finally, Tessa and Mariah had a talk about their future plans. What I really enjoyed and found interesting about the conversation uh, was about their kids' names, that it was from Kate and Cameron. The names of the children referenced by them is from some of their favorite movies and the line about the kid in kindergarten having a rock star mom, but it's a closest nerd. It came from an interview that they did back together in December 2020. It's a little nod to the Tariah fans. You know, I bet that Mariah and Tessa have a pretty strong uh, and pretty vocal fan base. I bet they do. So it's interesting that they, that YNR decided to lean into that and throw some little seeds in, into that conversation for those fans. Um, I, yeah, I didn't know that. I never would have picked up that there was more to that conversation that was kind of going on in the subtext. So thanks for letting us know that. I mean, I think Mariah's surrogacy journey has definitely opened up some dialogue between Mariah and Tessa, and that was good to see. I was critical of that last week, and we got some more good conversation between them this week. I mean, having children is something that Mariah and Tessa never talked about, but now they're, you know, realizing that having a family might be a path that they'd like to travel together, and Mariah is not the only one in the relationship who can carry a child. So there's a whole wide world of options out there for Mariah and Tessa to explore if YNR keeps Tessa around. I mean, I don't know. She may be one of those underutilized contracts that are on the chopping block. I don't know who's safe and who's not safe. I do worry about Chelsea, though. Ambrini says, I can't relate to 99% of YNR stories, but Chelsea's hit very close. A few years ago, we found out that my mom has an AVM for short. It's basically a tangling of the arteries and veins, messing up the blood and oxygen flow. The doctors warned us that it could burst, so she had a procedure that goes up through the vein to the brain and glued some areas to fix the flow. Well, during it, my mom had a stroke, and she's not the same but can still walk and talk, so we're grateful for that. 
Yeah, this is interesting. Jamie needs to check in with us too about how she's thinking this stroke uh, story is going because um, I don't have any experience with this. I don't know anyone who has had a stroke, thank goodness. Um, but I'm sure that there, I mean, it's so common. It's very common and I'm sure there are a lot of viewers out there that are watching the show right now and can relate to Chelsea's stroke. It's just that YNR seems, I don't know, to me, it, it just almost seems like they've turned it into something Thing that's just um it's almost too much fantasy maybe it's very obvious that it's about the adam and sharon thing i mean the second we entered into fantasy land of chelsea imagining sharon and adam kissing all the time it took away something from the stroke itself part of the story but maybe that's just me t nicole says i found adam's idea to have chelsea to have chelsea's dislike slash hatred towards sharon as a way to heal her not that great but having sharon criticize and try to rile chelsea up as a way to push her recovery seemed cruel i don't think using someone uh, uh who's a stroke patient i don't think Using someone a stroke patient dislikes as a way to help them recover is healthy or a practical way to help them. No, definitely not. De and that's the thing, too. We've entered into this fantastical realm with it, which, you know, in, in a lot of cases, that's that's what we're here for, is to have that fantasy. But uh, when you're dealing with something that's touchy that a lot of people have been through personally, I, I don't know. I wish they would be a little more delicate, a little more respectful of it. Tony says Chelsea needs Chloe to visit her and help her. Chelsea doesn't like Adam anymore. Chloe, um, or Chelsea doesn't like Adam anymore. Chloe never has. So Chelsea can be out of her chair. Chloe will know and together they can start planning something. Okay, two things on this, Tony. You think Chloe's going to be the first one to find out that Chelsea has recovered, or maybe uh, Chelsea will tell Chloe that she's recovered and she wants her help to check in on Adam and Sharon. Ooh. The other really interesting point that you make here um, is, is observing that it seems like Chelsea wants Adam, but that she may not like Adam anymore. I really like that comment because it's sort of true. She seems to want him and be jealous of Sharon, but it does seem like she almost doesn't like him anymore. Maybe that's so that when all of this is over and Chelsea recovers, she can tell Adam and Sharon to just go ahead and be together, but then I don't really know what becomes of Chelsea. Nick is taken with Phyllis, and we all know Josh loves Michelle Stafford, so I don't think anything's going to happen to her. I don't know. Maybe maybe we were hinted at a little bit of a, a Nick, Chelsea, Phyllis triangle when Chelsea recovers, because we did have Nick showing some concern for Chelsea and Phyllis seemed okay with it, but slightly annoyed. So who knows? It could go back in that direction. But we know Adam and Sharon are going to get together. That's the one piece of this that it's that's pretty clear. Oh, you know, Diana says, I wonder what Adam tells Connor every time Connor asks to speak to his mom. Adam must be running out of excuses as it's been a long time now since Chelsea had her stroke. Connor must know something's wrong by now. Yeah, I didn't think of that either. It's so true. Adam had the idea this week to bring Connor home, but that didn't occur to me that maybe Connor's wondering why he can't even talk to his mom. Hmm. <sighs> Let's pick a different topic. Superplex says, has anyone noticed that Billy and Lily have been holding hands? They must be practicing selective COVID testing. As I wrote before, more intimacy uh, must be being demanded by the network brass. You know, I didn't notice that. It's funny. I, the intimacy thing, the touching, the kissing, it hasn't bothered me as much as it's bothered other people. I don't know why. I, I guess it should. I guess I should be bothered by it. But no, I didn't notice the hand touching. And so therefore, I wouldn't notice that there wasn't hand touching. <laughs> so I don't need the rapid COVID testing or whatever it is they're doing um, that's an extra expense. But uh, maybe some of you certainly do. Um, hey, let's talk about Victoria's little dream sequence there because uh, Gary says, hey, you pull back the camera on the bride to reveal her real bridegroom, Billy Miller. 
Yeah, how about those edits in Victoria's uh, dream sequence where she was getting married to Billy, she was um, pulling Billy up out of the gutter, it was all Amelia Heinley and her time as Victoria, but uh, they edited out and the original, well, I guess not original, no, the, they edited out the Billy Miller version of Billy. Yeah, that was, that was interesting the way they, they did that. Good, good, uh, good little sequence there. Good creative way of recapping the Billy and Victoria love story, even though Jason Thompson wasn't in it. Leslie says, I liked Victoria's hair during her dinner with Nikki. It made her look softer somehow. The center part was straighter, and I think it was the change. I still want a few less inches, but I thought it was an improvement. Yeah, I thought Victoria looked really good in those scenes, too. She just seemed casual with her glass of wine, and yeah, I, I, I liked that, too. Diane Kay says, <laughs> quote, who is there left to meet? I've already met all the people. <laughs> is Victoria right? Has she dated or married all the men in Genoa City? <laughs> that was a funny line, and it was well delivered uh, by Amelia. Uh, who is, Nikki's telling her she needs to go out and meet people, and she says, who's there left to meet? I've already met all the people. That's great. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, do you remember, uh, let's see, Victoria, who all has she been with? I don't know that there's anyone left. Yeah, I don't know. Who could we pair her with? I thought it might even be a hint of Theo, and that didn't end up happening. Oh, well, let's talk about uh, this, a different topic. Gary says, beyond a budding romance, Devon has been family to Amanda. A brother when she's had no other. So when she feels betrayed by him, when the identity of Elena's baby comes out, it's gonna hurt. Only then, Naya will reappear to offer her daughter the support she can. Amanda deserves to end up with something out of this. It's a good classic YNR story to go round and round for years, possibly. In the previews, Amanda is asking Devon what his deepest, darkest secret is, and then Nate is asking Elena about her dream. So yes, it does seem as if we've kind of switched up the, the couples emotionally at least. Uh, but you know, I, what I really cared about was Naya. Amanda mentioned to Devon on Friday that she had had a couple of brief text messages from Naya. Well, that seems very relevant to me. I care much more about Amanda's mom and what's going to happen with that than I do who's going to hook up. I don't know why, but I felt very compelled by the story with Naya and Amanda and then, okay, well, if she's, I mean, Imani su is suing <laughs> Amanda to stay away from Naya and yet Naya is initiating text messages? That seems significant. I'd like to know more about that. Oh, well, Victoria says, I feel for Gloria being turned down for a job for a number of Gen from a number of Genoa City residents. I know Gloria can be trouble. I remember in the classic episodes when Gloria worked at Fenmore's as a clerk. Jill came in with Tom, Gloria's estranged husband, and Gloria was so jealous she ruined an expensive blouse that Jill was trying on. Needless to say, Gloria was not the employee of the week. Gloria, like many others, have claimed that they've changed, and this is code for give me another chance. I hope Lauren, in spite of her and Gloria's history, will give Gloria a job. When Gloria's around, things happen. Yeah. <laughs> The Gloria story is so relatable. I mean, she just wants to work. She's not even trying to be picky about where. I'm not, she's not like entitled, like, I want a job at the highest ranking position in the company. No, she just wants to work. She just wants to contribute. And I really like your comment also because it is reminding us of the time that Gloria worked at the Fenmore's Boutique, which Michael mentioned this week. Apparently, Gloria burned it down. Now, this is where I should have done some additional research because I do not remember Gloria burning down the Fenmore's Boutique. That's pretty great. I remember when Dina burned down the underground. That's what they do when they need to get rid of a set. They just have somebody burn it down. Did Gloria do it on purpose? Somebody give me a refresher on that. <laughs> 
Let's talk about Kyle's kid. Astra says, now that's the kind of secret that should have been revealed a year ago instead of that anticlimactic Zoe thing. Mm -hmm. And T. Nicole says, one of my first thoughts was, can you imagine if this news came out while Kyle was married to Lola? Summer probably won't take the news that well, but it would have been worse with Lola if Kyle was bearing, uh, if Kyle was buying an expensive purse was was almost the end of them. Yeah, I don't think that uh, Lola would have taken very well to it. Um, you know, Ellen also said, what about Lola? She has no story. She acted queasy about two weeks ago and I thought she was gonna be the pregnant one. Now, yeah, I mean, we've got Lola floating off on the peripheral of this also. Is she going to go along with Ray? Is there going to be some sort of off-screen tragedy that happens to the Rosales family? And Ray and uh, Lola are going to have to run off to save the day? I don't know, but it doesn't really look good for her considering she's not in any storylines with Theo gone. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I mean, it's... It, the thing they if they're bringing on Kyle's kid that's three they've got to bring on the mother otherwise there's no point in the secret doing anything it doesn't progress the story at all it's kind of a nice you know shocking moment for one day of material but unless Swainar is actually going to play this for the the drama of the kid being in somewhere in Kyle's life then it's it's no good so uh, if, if are we gonna get some mom to follow it, there was also mentioned that whoever the the affair happened so Kyle and the person had an affair but there's also this high-powered husband who's off uh, somewhere who doesn't know about this so are we gonna get the high-powered guy like I don't know I don't need new new characters I kind of wish that my just would have found a way to work with the ones that we had I'd still rather have Theo I'd still rather have Heat Theo than the high-powered guy if they're gonna bring that on I don't know maybe they're cutting Contracts and trying to hire people for less? I got no idea what they could be thinking. Ellen says, I can't decide if I'm excited to see Theo again or if I'm just going to be mad all over again that they wrote him out of the show. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm feeling at the, at the current, too. It was so great to see his face, but then I'm like, uh, this is only for one day. Kamna says, I'm not sure what I'm more excited about. Bill Spencer coming to town or Theo coming back? I want Theo to stay a while. I'd be so happy to see him. And is it just me, or did he look even better? <laughs> yeah, he looked good. He's got a personality. That's what the appeal is with Theo. It's not always what he did with his story or who he interacted with. The actor just had personality. He had style. He had swag. He brought a little different flavor, different flair to the show. And to me, that made him worth keeping around. Now, I mean, if it was between Theo and Chance, I'd keep Theo, no doubt about it. Chance is nice. I like a lot of things about him, but... But Theo seemed like a unique individual, and I really appreciated that about him. I thought he could have been a good match, love, or just partnership with Sally. Uh, Superplex says uh, about uh, Sally asking Jack why he's single, uh, I guess you haven't been in town long enough to know my life history. Well, does Sally have enough time to read an encyclopedia? <laughs> The Encyclopedia of Jack's Love Life, A to Z, all the volumes. How many volumes would that be? That's the question. Although, I don't know, an Encyclopedia of Jack's Love Life might be a little long for a hip, young, junior director of internet marketing, so maybe Sally could be responsible for getting Jack's Love Life Encyclopedia transcribed uh, onto the internet. Like, maybe Sally could be responsible for the Jack Abbott Wikipedia, the Jackiepedia. Okay, everybody, I think that's going to do it for me for today. Trying a new format here. I got a feeling it's not going to be completely smooth, but I'm doing my best to still provide the video and the audio and make it seem like nothing's changed, even though definitely things have changed. <laughs> 
So I decided to go out and buy myself a webcam. Gee, welcome to the newest century, Allie, a webcam. Maybe the webcam is a, a, a little bit of an easier way to get the video out there. Um, and the audio, I have a really good mic, but I realized about 30 minutes into Wyatt chat that it was not, uh, not configured correctly. There's a lot of moving pieces in this. The video goes separate from the audio and they're edited both separately and oh goodness it's a work in progress I'm just not the per same person anymore <laughs> that I used to be I'm a work in progress <laughs> oh but you know this is a lot, lot more of a relaxing setup as soon as I get the kinks worked out hey I, I had a couple of comments last week who, who both said that the quality of everything seemed all right and, and I will continue to improve it if it's not great uh, right away I know that I, I do try I really do try to keep a good strong eye on the quality and uh, if it's if it's ever not there know that I know <laughs> I'm already hating myself and I will do my best to fix it <laughs> Oh goodness. All right. Let's call it a week. I've I've, I've vented. <laughs> I've got some good good energy, good strong energies put out there for today and uh, now it's time for me to rest. It's your turn though. I know you guys are feeling all kinds of ways about what happened with Jan, so go to yrchat.com to leave your comments, vote in the poll, get it all off your chest. I know you want to. <laughs> and come back next week and we'll figure out who got cut then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out who gets cut next week, uh, next Sunday. Come on back and we'll chat about it. I love you guys and I thank you for being here with me. I hope you have a good week. I'll see you next time. Bye.